And good morning to all of you. Thank you again for joining me on this channel. This is Russ Barkley, your aging boomer, here with your weekend update on new ADHD research this week. But as always, first up are going to be some pretty bad dad jokes, but they just make you laugh because some of them are that bad. So uh, let's start with these. I want to warn you that uh, if the ads on this screen bother you, then just look away for the dad jokes. And if you don't like the dad jokes, just skip to the timeline in the description to the first article, and that should take care of it. All right, here's your dad jokes for this morning. Son, he said, hey, dad, can you please explain to me what a solar eclipse is? Dad says, no sun. Get it? S-U-N. That's the bad one. Here's another one. Why did the man fall down the well? He couldn't see that well. Oh, oh, boo, I can hear you hiss booing right now. Here's one. I once submitted 10 puns to a joke competition. I really thought with that many, one was sure to win. Sadly, no pun in 10 did. Okay. Uh, the last one's actually a little bit better, I think. So here we go. Where do you take someone who's been in a peekaboo accident? To the ICU. Oh my God. Russ, stop it. You're hurting me. Okay. Let's go on to our first article this morning. We have five to discuss, so it's going to be a little bit longer video this morning, but it's, uh, it's been a pretty productive week out there in the journal. So let's have a look at our first article, which comes to us from the journal European Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, and it deals with perinatal mental health of mothers and their offspring risk for internalizing and externalizing difficulties, as well as specifically ADHD. By the way, internalizing means disorders like anxiety, depression, neurosis, and so on. Externalizing, of course, means disorders like ADHD, oppositional behavior, aggression, conduct problems, just so you know what those terms mean. But we're specifically interested in the risk for ADHD. You know, I almost didn't review this because how many studies do we have to review that have failed to consider the genetic effects of the disorder between mothers and their offspring. I don't know. It's a lot out there. And it often is these large scale epidemiologic studies that want to go looking for relationships between things about the home, about the family, about the parents and the child's risk for ADHD. But they don't take into consideration that the parents also have ADHD and that there's a huge genetic liability that could explain any connection. But here we go. This one comes to us uh, from the follow-up study that was done on the island of Crete, as I recall, known as the RIA mother-child cohort study. And it is evaluating a very large sample of mother-child pairs, about 434 mother-child pairs that they're following. And they have evaluated these individuals on several occasions from ages 4 to 15. What did they find? They found that higher levels of maternal anxiety and neuroticism were associated with an increased risk of children's internalizing, externalizing, and specifically ADHD symptoms. They also found that maternal depression postnatally, that is after the child was born, was also related to a rise in ADHD symptoms in this population. So at this point, they're just talking about associations. I'm fine with that. But in the concluding sentence, they go on to imply causation. They say that the findings emphasize the importance of perinatal mental health in children's behavioral and emotional development. And here it is, suggest the need for prevention and early intervention programs to support the mental health of the mothers and of course the children. That statement implies a causal inference that it's the mother's mental status that is affecting the child's risk for the disorder. And you know, from my repeated references on this channel to this, you can't say that until you account 
for the elephant in the room. And that elephant is the massive effect of genetics in these families on risk between parents, in this case mothers, and their offspring. If you don't control for that, the rest of this really can't be interpreted in any causal way. So here we go again. One more opportunity for Russ to beat this dead horse about the lack of genetically informed research designs in this kind of epidemiologic study. Would somebody just pay attention to this and stop accepting these articles for publication? Because that's a massive methodological problem. Okay, enough said. Now that I can get off my high dead horse, let's go on to our second article, which is from the Journal of Attention Disorders and is a small article regarding the link between ADHD and rumination and whether or not ADHD medication affects that relationship, that linkage. As you know, people with ADHD often report higher levels of intrusive thoughts, mind wandering, and to some extent, rumination, although that tends to go more with depression, with anxiety, and with cognitive disengagement syndrome, that other attention disorder. That wasn't examined in this study, but they're looking at the degree of ADHD symptoms in college students, about 4,700 college students, and the extent of rumination, and then they're looking at whether or not medication for ADHD affected the frequency of ruminative ideas or thoughts. And what did they find? They, of course, found that it was the ADHD inattention symptoms that were most predictive of ruminative thinking. No surprise there, that's been seen before. But they also found that those who took stimulant medication had significantly less or a significantly smaller relationship with ruminative thinking, implying, just implying, that the medication might help to reduce ruminative thinking. On the other hand, remember, this is a correlation. One could try to make the case that people who are less prone to ruminative thinking with ADHD are more likely to seek out and get on medication. That's not at all far-fetched. So while the study tries to imply that medication might help these students with their ruminative thinking, not just their ADHD symptoms, we can't say that for sure. Okay, let's go to study number three. This appeared in the Journal of Affective Disorders. This is a very nice paper because it's addressing what I think is an issue of great societal interest at the moment, and that is whether there has been a change in the prevalence of ADHD, specifically post-2020, the great era of the pandemic lockdowns that we were forced to endure by many of the governments in the world, and which have been said to have been associated with an increase in the prevalence of ADHD. Well, was it? <clears throat> Let's have a look. This study looked at, get this, 40 studies across 17 countries, and one of the studies actually spanned 42 countries. These are all put into this review, and the reviewers found there was no significant rise in the prevalence of ADHD pre or post 2020. So contrary to what we are all hearing in the media, that there has to have been this great increase in the prevalence of the disorder, this study says no, there wasn't. By the way, the worldwide prevalence of ADHD in children in the various pre-2020 reviews was between 5 and 7 percent, and in adults around 3 percent, perhaps a little higher depending on the country. So that's your worldwide prevalence. This review says it didn't change. Now, let's distinguish here between two terms. Prevalence, which is the overall occurrence of the disorder in the population at a particular point in time. It's not ref referring to the referral to a clinic, getting diagnosed, okay? It's simply saying at this slice in time, what percentage of the population has this disorder? It's usually based on large-scale epidemiologic studies. Now, incidence refers to the occurrence 
of new cases. That is, what percent of cases were newly identified in the population during a particular period of time, usually a month, six months, a year? What was the incidence of new identified cases? Now, you can have a dramatic difference in prevalence and incidence. And part of that can be you can see no change in prevalence but a rise in incidence because incidence is number of new cases identified, not necessarily the number of cases in the population is changing. So what this review found is that there probably was some evidence, though it isn't particularly reliable, that there was an increase in detection of disorder during and after the pandemic lockdowns. But that has to do with greater awareness, greater seeking out services, and therefore greater identification. It doesn't mean that these were new occurrences of the disorder in the population based on prevalence. In other words, these cases were already there. They just hadn't been referred and identified yet. So again, we might see that while there is a rise in identification, there was no change in prevalence. That's a very important finding in my opinion. So if somebody tries to tell you that there was a change based on the pandemic causing ADHD in the population, this review says, "Uh uh-uh, probably not. Oh, next up is a article from the journal Medicine, and this is on the relationship between PTSD and ADHD and 24 different gastrointestinal diseases. It's the first time I've ever seen this sort of examination, particularly with regard to the genetics that might predispose to those two disorders but also might predispose to GI or gastrointestinal diseases. So what did this large-scale study find? And by the way, this study used an incredibly large population of individuals in the thousands. And what did they find? Well, let's look down here. So we found that the genetic susceptibility to PTSD was associated with one GI disease. You want to know what that was? pancreatic cancer, the risk increased by about 30% if you had susceptibility to PTSD. Now, the genetic susceptibility to ADHD was associated with four GI diseases, gastroesophageal reflux, okay, something I've experienced before, gastric ulcer, duodenal ulcer, and chronic gastritis. So the authors conclude that this study provides genetic evidence for causal relationships between the susceptibility to PTSD and ADHD and GI diseases. I didn't know about that before I saw this review. So a new finding there for us to consider. Lastly, we're going to take a look at a study published over in BMC Psychiatry. This one also new to me, looks at the causal association between genetic susceptibility to ADHD and various metabolites in blood plasma. Now, this study is using over 292,000 cases, particularly those involved in ADHD. It's going to look at 871 different metabolites in plasma. So a very interesting, very large study here. And what did they find? They found that there were, let's see, 22 metabolites were associated with an increased risk in having ADHD. 20 other metabolites were associated with a decreased risk for ADHD. All in all, the study shows that genetic liability to ADHD may affect the abundance of 91 metabolites with a subset of those related to increased risk for the disorder, but another subset related related to decreased risk. By the way, this doesn't mean that the plasma metabolites are causing ADHD, simply means that they're associated 
with it. And that may have to do with the genes for ADHD may also be active in the creation of these blood plasma metabolites. Remember, genes have multiple roles to play in our development and are not just specific to one certain uh, event or disorder or condition. They may play roles across various disorders. As you know, I've said before, the genes for ADHD are also related to a larger suite of genes that are create genetic liability to mental health disorders. And now we're finding they also are involved in creating liability for various medical conditions, and in this case, certain metabolites in the blood. The authors go on to talk about how some of these metabolites might have the potential to be targeted for future drug treatment, and that a few of them had already been targeted for drug intervention. So uh, a very interesting study there on the relationship between genetic susceptibility to ADHD and blood plasma metabolites. Okay, I hope you found this morning's review interesting. I certainly did. A couple of new findings here. And as always, I am grateful for your viewing of this channel and specifically this video. And I hope you continue to find these videos to be informative to you. Thanks again, everybody, for watching. And as always, live well, be well, take care, and bye for now.